Uh, I'm the general manager of the research center of NEC in Israel. I'll tell you a bit about us. Uh, we do have the email here of my associate, Or Katz, who's there. And Or did most of the coding and most of the analysis of the data and also some of the important ideations. So anyone who wants to know more about this, and this is a very practical tool, uh, you're welcome to contact Or and, and ask for more information. So abstention or abstaining is a very loaded term. Uh, it's used in court, it's used when you choose not to vote, but it's also choose, used a lot recently about uh, not having any kind of sexual relationships before you're married. So we're not talking about that, okay? Uh, we're talking about it in the essence illustrated here. When not to trust what the neural network or the classifier tells you. When not to use it. Okay, just a very short, shameless, but short plug about NEC. So next year, we're 120 years old. Yay! Uh, we don't have a colorful logo, we don't make our money selling ads, and we don't have slides or dog walkers, I'm sorry, but we have very nice offices. Uh, NEC devotes, uh, we're 100,000 people globally, and NEC, much like IBM, which is of a similar age, though younger, uh, devotes about half percent of annual revenue to pure research of all kinds. Well, pure is a matter of opinion. But it's a Japanese company, no? Uh, the headquarters is in Japan, yes. Uh, but we have 20,000 people around the world. Uh, so in terms of our research centers, again, not sales or operations, research centers, we have uh, one in Cupertino, one in Princeton, uh, we have in Heidelberg, we have Beijing, of course, Japan, Singapore, India, and the most recent one here in Israel. So we're the smallest, but we're growing fast. We're 25 people and the areas uh, we work in, uh, we do what's called open innovation, meaning we don't just do research, but actually we're usually more looking to collaborate with universities, as you can see, not necessarily in Israel. We work with Sandy Pentland from the MIT Media Lab. He's, he's a friend, I think we can say he's a friend now, but of course our focus and natural place of co collaboration would be Israel, time zone wise and travel wise, it's much easier. Uh, NEC also invests in Israel uh, and, you know, we spend quite a lot of money here every year now. We're going to increase that. Uh, and the kind of projects we do, uh, I would say the main theme is applications of data science, machine learning and deep learning to actual enterprise uh, data or city data or government data. So uh, we have, for example, a cyber protection project we're doing with the Hagichon plant in Jerusalem, water plant, supplying about 1.5 million people. Uh, we're working on embedded deep learning. You can see the picture there, meaning using the new ch inference deep learning chips, the small ones of very low power and very low cost uh, to do things like finding where people are or what they're doing or where cars are or where the city, uh, where the city has congestion, things like that. Uh, we also have medical analysis, again, using deep learning. There we really go deep. It takes a long time to train, we use a lot of GPUs. I have to sign for more and more checks for that. But that's what it is. Or is actually working a lot on, on that. Uh, and we have systems already installed in the radiology department, for example, of Asuta. We also work with accelerators. And we do use Python almost exclusively, not as it was not dictated, we just Everyone decided it's the easiest way when you have to involve so many projects using different tool sets. And, and just uh, uh, some of the past uh, research, uh, many names that you know or have heard about actually started at NEC Labs. Jan LeCun actually did his first CNN for face detection, yes. 2003, you can see the video there, you can see it's an old video. Uh, uh, you can find it on YouTube. So. In a way, some of these ideas started in NEC labs in Princeton many, many years ago. Of course, we didn't have the PR agency and the very fancy logos, but the YouTube is still there. And uh, today we do a lot of uh, work in Cupertino on the uh, deep machine learning for GANs ma mainly, for regenerating images and comparing images. Uh, Chandrakar is a very strong leader there of the research. And we do some cryptography here in Israel. furukawa -san, uh, is actually Japanese, but he's an expat. He's been living with us in Israel for a year and a half, working with the Bar Ilan University, Professor Lindell and others. And very recently, just two days ago, his ba third baby was born here in Israel. Yay! So what does abstaining mean in machine learning? Uh, as we all know, 
usually a predictor would not just give you a discrete number of the prediction, it would give you some kind of certainty measure. If we use regular, I would say standard deep learning frameworks, uh, we would typically use softmax layers or uh, uh, something similar. So what's known as the logic values. People call it the probabilities. I think that's a singularly bad name. Okay, because there is nothing really that relates those two probabilities. But logic values is, the, is, is a equivalent term and doesn't say anything about whether it's a probability or not. And it's just a number, right? So if we have a classifier and there's 10 classes and each of the 10 neurons gives you a number between, let's say, 0 to 1, you, you pick up the highest. And we all sort of know from the courses of, that if uh, now we want to change the threshold, right? Everyone here has used the threshold or at least is aware of it. You don't just take the largest one, but you kind of look at the number. Is it uh, very close to one and all the others are very small? Or is it actually not so large and it's very similar to some of the others and then maybe I should trust it less? But, and I say that again because that's important. If that's the only thing you take from the talk, it's important. There is nothing which correlates that necessarily with probabilities, okay? Nothing, except a bunch of totally uh, Bayesian idealistic assumptions that are never right, and uh, if they were all right, then you could say maybe it would be probability. So, so let's just kill this name, okay? Uh, so research obviously tends to focus on improving performance because you can publish on this, right? If someone solved a problem with 70% probability and you solved it with 72%, then actually that's grounds for publication because we all have the same data set, so that's like a race, right? If you sh shave two tenths of a second from a long running time, only problem is usually 70% of something doesn't mean anything to anyone in the world, world. really nothing, okay? Uh, I don't think anyone wants to have a car that starts 70% of the time or a door that closes 80% of the time or a building that doesn't crash 90% of the time. It's meaningless. There are very few applications where it's not meaningless and those are very successful, right? Like advertisements, they're gonna be there anyway, so you might as well try to improve the average. No harm if you didn't see the right one. Uh, or things like telling you stories about you probably came from this part of the world or the other. I mean, I have no other source for the information, so I'm happy to use this information, okay? Or you're, you look more like Julia Roberts than someone else. There's no harm. But in the real world, where people actually should pay money on that, uh, it's harder. You cannot use things which are, are, are at this level of precision. So, in many cases, it's better to say you're not certain or that you abstain rather than just giving a number. But the problem is, how do you know that you might be wrong or not? As I said, you can use the thresholds. That's not necessarily a very good method. And I'll give some examples. But I think anyone who's ever tried it knows that, right? I mean, definitely raising thresholds and saying only if the numbers are really good, I would use it, helps. But how much and when does it help a lot? And when it doesn't, that's kind of a gray area. What can you do with it? Uh, uh, area, one thing, you can alert a person. If it's a medical diagnosis, you would just not make the diagnosis. You would call on someone to review the results. Uh, you could do things like, say, maybe stop the car. That's not the way of the cars right now because Tesla goes on, whatever happens, but maybe that's a good idea. You know, if you're not sure, if you, uh, maybe slowing down is a good idea. Uh, chain of command, on the right hand side, you can see a very good example. I stole this one from Microsoft. That's how they do their cyber defense. So you have a series of systems of increasing complexity and further and further from the user. And if the system that's on your, on your computer right now can't make a decision, they would defer the decision to a higher level. And that goes on for a rather long chain. And at the end, there's actually experts that look at the data, but they know when they're not sure. That's much better than saying you have malware or you don't. Uh, another example, just to say, sometimes the cost, actually usually the cost of making a mistake one way or the other is not symmetric, right? Uh, so for example, if you're t talking about uh, artificial insemination, that's a rather painful and long and emotionally dragging process. You don't want to do it if you're not sure the semen sample, the insemination example is perfect. So you'd rather actually throw away many and make, improve the chances that it succeeds. But I think you all get it. So what are the, med what are the approaches? I'll, I'll very quickly review the approaches being used right now. Uh, uh, research did take note. People in academia realized this is important. So here's a list of a few papers. Uh, 
basically, to be very crude, the first two, and many like them, are about changing the threshold. Okay? They do all kinds of mathematics, and then they say, okay, if you want this kind of certainty, you probably should use this threshold, higher or lower or something similar. They use some pretty complex mathematics sometimes to reach this number, but that's what they do, they just give you a number. Uh, dropout is something else. Uh, we all, I mean, I'm sure most people here or many have used the dropout when they're training, right? A neural network. Dropout, for those who are not familiar, it just means randomly severing many of the connections during the training, saying effectively, we don't want anything to depend too much on a specific neuron. If there is truth in the matter, it should rise uh, as a wisdom of the crowd. It's a little like elections, right? Over time, you, you, you may randomly or not randomly miss some people in the voting process, but as long as you have the masses, you think, okay, that's okay. That's dropout. So everyone knows, or most everyone knows about dropout uh, when you do the training. But people are saying, do it also when you do the inference, when you make the decision. If the decision for a specific sample is too dependent, dependent on a sp single specific neuron, uh, don't trust it. Okay, so that's another approach. There's the explanation methods, which are also very nice graphically and nice to think about, so I figured I mentioned them. There's all kinds of methods of figuring out uh, what was the reason, what was the part, the section of the input data that caused the network to reach a conclusion. Now, if these parts are illegitimate, don't trust it. A great example is on the right-hand side. Has anyone seen this picture before? Uh, it's a famous example of explanation methods. Uh, there was a network developed to differentiate between husky dogs and wolves, which are quite similar, okay, especially in the picture because a wolf is much bigger, but you don't see any growls and things, and it's in a pack. But anyway, the idea was, can we differentiate? And we got good results. I mean, good in the sense of like 99% of the papers, like good, don't trust it, it's, bu it's bullshit. It, the, the results seemed good, but then someone said, they actually seem too good. Let's find out what's the explanation. What parts of the picture affect the result? And lo and behold, you can si see it on the right-hand side. It's the snow, because wolves are in the snow. Yay! <laughs> now, zebras, okay, so the zebra grass might be a hint. Okay, maybe that's legitimate. Uh, and it looks like that, but of course, if you now take one of those zebra fish, the network will very happily say, that's a zebra. So if the explanation is not good in some way that you have to define as the designer, drop the result. Last method, uh, Orr and I and some others were working on it in February and March. And actually at the end of March, there was this publication, not by us, sadly. And I must say they did a uh, much more complete work. It's a PhD thesis of someone financed by Google, uh, same direction. So I'll give them credit and I'll even steal some of their charts because they're nicer than ours. The important thing is what you do, not who did it first. So the idea is very simple. Let's look at, use simple K nearest neighbors, the oldest method in the book, but apply it to various deep neural network layers. If you don't get what I'm saying, in one second you'll see the code, it's very simple. So you have a network, instead of just deciding based on you know the softmax layer or the last layer you kind of look at this layer the numbers and you say that's a vector by itself is that vector very similar or different from similar results of training samples okay so it's not a single number if you have 10 classes it would be 10 numbers if you have five it would be five and it's a vector and you can say okay i'm not just looking at the highest value of course that's the one i will choose but is it very similar in some ways to vectors of uh, training samples. And if so, maybe in some way they are similar to it. Maybe. That was the idea. The networks we have used, uh, we used uh, for the MNIST, you know, the digits, handwritten digits, binarized. Uh, we used a, a simple, rather simple model. We didn't develop a new model. Actually, we intentionally took existing models. And we used ResNet 50, right, or uh, on the more complex images. So those were the samples. The, Face the, the, the feature select, the feature uh, layer at the end. The layer, the so we use the softmax layer at first. The layer that app outputs the classes. Basically, we compared the traditional method and this method, which I'll now explain. The traditional method says we have a threshold. If something goes above this threshold, I will use the result. If not, I will not use, I will abstain. Okay? So when you have a threshold, any kind of threshold, 
you're actually deleting some part of the population. You're saying, I don't have anything to say there, but let's look about what's happening in the other cases. What we did instead, using some distance measures, Euclidean means L2, frankly, could have been L1, could have been L4, it doesn't matter that much. Could be Chebyshev, doesn't change the result much, but it's always good to know you have a selection. So for each sample, we looked at all the training samples, calculated the last softmax layer, actually we stored it in advance, and looked for the nearest neighbors to the new sample we have to classify. And our logic was, if the k nearest neighbors by this distance measure are from a single class, same class, and it's the same class that the network actually gives the highest score, we'll say it's okay. But if not, we'll say we don't trust it. Okay, uh, just maybe I'll, the figure I think shows it very well. And again, we stole that one from the other paper. They got the priority, we'll, we'll steal their figures. So the idea is you have a panda and you run it for a network. And in the last layer, uh, there are many training vectors which were similar to it and many others, maybe it could be a bus or something else. If it's a good sample, a good, a a good test sample that we trust, then uh, we would expect most of them to be pandas. We wouldn't expect it to be very similar in the upper layers to a bus. But if it's an adversarial example, or just a one that, that's bad, that we don't know what to say about, we might actually find that in many cases, in, man, in many layers, it's more similar to other things. I just want to show the code here. If anyone who wants more details, go to OR and you can explain. But I want to show how small and simple it is. It's all here. Because, as I said, the mathematics is very simple. Okay. Frankly, I'm an old timer. I didn't even know about this function. Uh, I just, you know, you can just take a vector, multiply it, just star with the matrix of ones, and you get what you want. A matrix of all the rows, the same vector. You subtract it from the original matrix of the softmax layers of all the training samples, and you take the argmin in Python, the minimum values. So you look at maybe the top, the bottom two, the bottom three, the bottom five, up to you. Of course, the more, the more you are strict, the more you say, I want it to the 10 nearest neighbors to be of the same category, you will lose more samples. Okay, you will have less to say. But maybe, that was the theory, when you do have something to say, you will be more right. And you are. Okay? Uh, so, uh, basically, you can see W is the number of nearest neighbors that we demanded be identical to that sample to make the, to make the, abs to make the, the claim we are sure we know what we're doing. So you can see that on all these samples, uh, you can get to a slightly lower percentage of the population, but with much higher numbers, okay? Now numbers matter a lot. Many people will say, okay, so it was 95% and now it's 97%, meh. The quest of going from 95 to 97 or 99 is called human industry. Nothing else matters. That's the truth, okay? When people work hard to make new cars or new electronics, it's to make your car break once in 10 years rather than one year. When they do that, they take the industry, everyone else is dead. Okay? So never measure that, measure the one minus or 100% minus. Going in many areas, going from 94% to 97% means you have a business or you don't. So actually, it works. And we didn't even have to work that hard. You saw the math is very simple. The one thing you do have to do is you have to keep an inventory of all your training samples. And it stands to reason, it was also validated, in fact, that the more training samples you have, the better this method is. If you have a very poor number of samples, you don't have many na potential neighbors to be nearest neighbors with. And then the, the method works less well. This is the important graph. The important part, of course, is the yellow part. What you, the green ones, meaning reg, regular thresholding, right? just playing with the threshold. So the important thing is actually not which graph is more to the right, which is upper. The important is these regions. What it means, I, I see some people nodding, so I think, but I'll just say it out loud to make sure everyone got it. It means you can go to regions. You, you want to go, this is your accuracy. This is your success. This is the money. The papers are there, the money is here, okay? So you want to go as high as possible. And with softmax, you just can't get there. So that's actually, by the way, I'm sure some other methods can do better. It's not that this necessarily is the best method, but it gets you to regions you couldn't get before in terms of performance. Of course, 
always at the price of not having what to say on many samples. So it's not, there's no magic here. We didn't make the network better. We just made it more modest. But that's very useful because then maybe you can develop a new network that will solve the cases on which you didn't know what to do. Or at least you know which kind of samples you need or what's the problem. And lo and behold, when you actually, you know, say, let's, let's look at it. Let's try to figure out what, why it happens and when, you get many interesting insights. Like, these are all examples which were mixed classified by the network, but you look at the nearest neighbors. And actually, they kind of make sense. And you say, okay, I can see if this was a seven and it was predicted as a, I can't read, two. Uh, what were the nearest neighbors? Uh, same for the eight, same for the four. Now, there is no law saying that it should be similar in a visually appealing way to us. But sometimes it is. It's worth a lot, if you're really serious about your data, to look at these correlations and try to figure out when I miscalculated, uh, how close or far I was, to the nearest neighbors, to the training samples, but not in the original image sense, but in the deep network, lo upper layer sense. Just to give some strong motivation that this can, that then, or had a ridiculous idea, and I told him, don't waste time on that, never waste time on those ideas, just, you know, let's publish, let's get it done, but he wouldn't listen, and, and it kept nagging at me. He said, why don't we go lower, okay? So at the end, we did try. <coughs> And it works, works very nicely. It actually gives even a bigger, you can see here a full example of transfer learning. The example by itself is like cookbook. It's like probably at least some of you did something just like that in an advanced course or as part of your work in industry. Just transfer learning of VGG16 or it could be a ResNet or a simple problem. Uh, and we got certain results. And lo and behold, you almost half your error with very little work. You didn't have to do anything very smart. Is it waste a lot of time collecting near one year's neighborhood? That's or absolutely right. The size of the Ve data is being uh, of the, uh, I would rather that this would be at the questions section, but I'll just say, you are right, but first of all, we were very primitive. We just ca actually physically calculated it. Anyone worth their salt, we are not, would use local similarity hashing or one of those methods, and then it would take milliseconds. The other thing I would urge argue is that you need to store all your uh, yeah. training uh, samples. Uh, and I think in a world, I'm sorry again, you're taking my time, so I'll, but I will say that since you said that. I think in a world where you need performance, those are minor things because CPUs get faster and memory gets faster. And actually, I'm yet to see a deep learning project which failed in industry because the compute was too large. When you really look at it, it's always the problem was just wasn't good enough. But that's just my personal experience, and, and we can talk about this after the talk. So just, uh, okay, this is the last one, uh, hand-waving. The hand-waving part, right? Because I can't really explain why it works, I'm, I don't, but I can really wave my hands nicely. So maybe that's part of the answer. Again, we stole from someone else the chart. That's what the layer before the softmax layer, the fully connected layer, often looks when you do transfer learning on images, at least. Uh, the green dots are the neurons that caused uh, the system to make a prediction that was right. The red ones are not. So usually, and I must say that in some samples we looked at, with our eyes at data, it looks like that. The last layer before the softmax, that layer, uh, typically when, when, when it fires, when the neurons fire, they don't all sort of fire at certain strengths. You have maybe 10% or 5% or 1% or 20% that fire very high and the others don't matter. And that's how the softmax layer then makes the decision, okay? But they fire at specific patterns. It's not like a gauge, like one fires if it's sort of uncertain, two if it's more certain, and ten. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up. But uh, some of them will fire in some patterns. If you were to look at it like a movie where the samples are flashed, you would see some patterns. And those patterns are what you do when you do the KNN. You find them because they were there when you trained, and they're there here. That's the important Hand, again, hand waving, there's no mathematical proof, but if you ask me, that's exactly why it works. You can do other things with it. I will not have time to talk about that. Uh, I will just maybe over that, just say that uh, the one thing you can, more you can do with it, which is very important, is figure out when things changed. Anyone who's ever done deep learning or machine learning in life, in real life, knows that you build a model and when people actually use it, over time, things change and always for the worst. The model always somehow, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, becomes worse until you retrain. That's because your population or environment changed. 
it could be uh, uh, ex 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 external factors, uh, it could be the samples coming in, it happens. The point is you want to know when it happened. But how will you know? The machine is in the field working, it, the machine doesn't know if it's wrong or right. It just outputs the results. We need to collect the, the true grand truth data. In real life, in, in real life, that's very expensive. Many people don't want to do that. Sometimes you can't do that. Uh, I'm not sure you can do it in all the cars when Uber goes really commercial or when Tesla goes commercial. So you have to give the machine a way to say, I'm not, I'm not doing well. I don't know why, but I'm not. The KNN method is an excellent way of doing that. If your average hit, if your average nearest neighbor being right was certain and suddenly it gets lower, that's a very good indication something has changed. The machine won't be able to fix it, but at least it will say something has changed. Thank you, sorry for that. Uh, I did take one question during, and any more questions, I'm happy to answer.